Um, that helped to expand the economy substantially, and the cascade of goods and productivity helped to offset what the Fed was doing with money and credit. So we were deceived for a time by thinking, hey, things look pretty good. We don't have much inflation, except maybe in the stock market and, and <laughs> land in Florida. But it was nonetheless real, it was substantial, and the inflation was undermining the long-term sustainability of, of, of economic growth. It was in late 1928 that the Federal Reserve, becoming a bit alarmed at the uh, at what it, its inflation had uh, begun to create, thinking that perhaps it was fueling a speculative boom, reversed its policy and began to uh, slow the growth rate of the money supply, then later to contract it. And in fact, what begins in late 28, uh, in hindsight, will become a three, three and a half year contraction of the nation's money supply by about one third. Now, if you've ever wondered why does the economy seem to go through the, these booms and busts, this roller coaster, look at monetary policy. And you'll find that it too looks like a roller coaster. In the 20s and the 30s, you had precisely that. You had this dramatic growth rate in money and credit, followed by a contraction, 66% growth rate by some estimates, followed by a one third contraction. You have some people who like to say, well, once you have inflation, of course you shouldn't have done it in the first place, but once you've done it, then it's a good thing to uh, stop it and then uh, withdraw that uh, currency and credit and contract to, to stabilize. I don't know if the school of thought that says, don't inflate in the first place, but once you've done it, then at some point, as soon as you can, you stop it, but stabilize, don't contract. The idea that an engineered deflation is the cure for an engineered inflation. It's like uh, running over a man with a truck and then deciding that the way to help him out is to put it in reverse and back up over it. And that's exactly what we did with money and credit policy. We, we uh, uh, dramatically raised the money and credit supply, drove interest rates to rock bottom levels, and then later contracted it, jacked interest rates way up. In, in real terms, they became quite substantial by the early 1930s. This explains why the Depression begins in 1929, this erratic monetary policy that uh, first fueled a bubble and then burst it. Some people will look at the stock market crash of October 1929 and say, well, that's what caused the Depression. The stock market fell apart. And then it dragged everything else down with it. But that would ignore the, the fundamentals that I've just talked about. The stock market was mirroring these substantial changes in monetary policy. If you, in fact, if you look back at those days, although we talk about Black Thursday, October 24, 1929, and there was a Black Monday and a Black Tuesday, before the end of the year, it would be Black every day of the week, and with the stock market plummeting. But the stock market actually peaked out in August of 1929. We had a lot of bad days before the big crashes in October, and there's a reason for that. The smart money, like the Joseph B. Kennedys, the Bernard Baruchs, the people who are a bit more sophisticated in their investing and they know what to look for and they watch things like money supply, what Congress is doing, trade patterns, and so forth, they saw the change in monetary policy before the general public did. They saw that the, the Fed was taking the, uh, the punch away from the party, was raising interest rates, and it was the pressure of the smart money selling their stocks that caused the market to, to top out in August to begin a decline. It wasn't until the masses of people sensed change in the air and stampeded that you then had uh, those very, very bad days, day on end, uh, in the stock market in October and November. If nothing else had happened, I think we might have seen some recovery in 1930. And maybe this would have gone down in history as one of many of those short episodes of, of uh, difficult times that we rebound from in, in short order. But something else did happen in 1930, and that leads me now to the second phase of the Great Depression. Think back, if you can, from your knowledge of history to uh, 1930. You might recall that we didn't yet have a depression. Through the spring of 1930, we didn't have a depression here. We had bad days on the stock market, but it had already regained half of the ground that it had lost. Uh, and uh, uh, 
things were not looking so poorly in the spring of 1930. We regained much of that ground. And unemployment, by the way, was only, in the spring of 1930, 8.5%. It was less than it is today at 10.2. That's not depression levels yet. This is just a bad recession. What takes a recession in 1930 and makes it very quickly the depression? We call the second phase of the Great Depression the disintegration of the world economy. The disintegration of the world economy. Here's what happens. Yeah, first understanding the backdrop, the Republican Party is in charge of the House and Senate and the White House in the person of Herbert Hoover. And back in those days, maybe, maybe less so today, the Republican Party was the protectionist party. The Democrats were known, going back to Burr from Cleveland and before, as the Free Trade Party. So you have this high, nagging unemployment with just a few months to go before the midterm elections. Republicans decide, with the help of some Democrats, that they need to do something to get this 8.5% unemployment down, so they pass the infamous smoot Pauley tariff. Passed in June of 1930, signed by President Hoover, which raised tariffs to an all-time high and virtually closed the border. The thinking was, well, uh, to put those people back to work here in this country, we need to raise taxes on imported goods enough to make it too costly for Americans to buy those things, and instead then they'll buy goods made in their home, and that'll put those people back to work. That was the thinking, but it had precisely the opposite effect. And here's why. You cannot close the door to imports without sooner or later closing the door to exports. Trade is ultimately a two-way street. If foreigners cannot sell their goods here, how can they earn the dollars that they need to buy here? So it would have been bad enough even if foreign governments hadn't retaliated, but they did. They made matters even worse by imposing higher tariffs on American goods. Smooth Holly ignited a worldwide trade war and trade ground to a halt. So industries that were dependent upon uh, the import trade, the export trade were heavily hit. One in particular in this country, and this will be a special interest to Kansans, I think, because uh, you were hit especially hard because of the importance of this industry. One industry in America was especially hard hit because it had been selling about a third of what it produced in overseas markets. And now with the stroke of the presidential pen, those markets disappeared. And the industry I'm thinking of was agriculture. American farmers were selling about a third of their production in overseas markets, but now foreigners couldn't buy it. They couldn't sell their goods here, so they couldn't earn the dollars that they needed to buy American goods. So you may have seen old newsreels of American farmers uh, dumping milk into ditches and, or uh, killing large numbers of baby chicks because they no longer pay them to raise them to maturity. Farm prices plummeted. Naturally, you've just wiped out a third of their markets. At the same time, you have the Federal Reserve contracting the money supply. So you have these uh, farm bankruptcies by the thousands all across the country. This will have a spiraling downward effect because with the bankruptcy of so many farms, you have then the bankruptcies of many rural banks. You look at the, the massive numbers of bank failures in the early 1930s, and you'll find that overwhelmingly they're concentrated in rural areas, largely because of the impact of, of, of smooth hauling on the nation's farms. Thousands of farmers walked off the farms in bankruptcy in the wake of smooth hauling. And that 8.5% unemployment will, within a year, rise to well beyond 15%. And ultimately, incidentally, the worst of unemployment will yet to be achieved uh, or realized. Uh, it will reach as high as 27, 28% by 1934. So here you have this awful situation made much worse by an act of Congress in 1934. There's another event that I include at this point, even though it isn't related to the world economy, but it happens before uh, the third phase of the Depression, so I, I throw it in here, but it is very substantial in its impact. It happened in 1932. What do you suppose is occurring with the federal budget by 1932, with massive bankruptcies, People not um, investing, they're not, their businesses are going broke, they're out of work, 